Hello everyone, I'm Scruffy at Scruffy Tales, and this is the War Zone. And this particular video has been a bit delayed, but here we go, it's uh, finally getting done. Holding the line, the tactics that Russia and Ukraine relies, relies upon uh, in order to hold the line. And also, we will also take a look at the strategical reality for both Ukraine and Russia. And we will be starting off with taking a look at Russian tactics uh, during the summer of 2023, holding the line at all cost. And uh, right, so here we have a uh, section of the front line. Uh, that used to be the front line, uh, where you had Ukrainian troops up here uh, in the north. You had the Russian troops uh, further south across the field and vast, vast uh, amounts of mines spread out all over the place. And uh, before Ukraine made an attack, they would send in drones to scout out Russian positions and keep an eye on the Russians as... Uh, the Ukrainians were moving around to see what the Russians were up to. And then at the front line, Ukraine would uh, move up with some scouts, uh, either on foot or using a vehicle, maybe come under fire, and they would have a drone in position to take a look what the Russians were doing, and they would see, oh shit, the Russians have this lane covered, move so we move back, try and avoid the minefields, do the same thing at another location. Oops, came under fire again. This is not a good place to advance. Could be mines, could be a Russian fire, you know, whatever. It, it was blocked. And then they would try at another location and nothing happens. And now Ukraine have a path where they don't come under fire, they don't hit mines, and they have drones taking a look at the Russian positions, and they realized that this is where we could potentially breach. We can attack uh, down this lane. So the scouts return, nothing happens. Now Ukraine knows what to do, they have a plan. Now there's one problem obviously, and that is that Russia has drones as well, and the drones are all over the place spying on the Ukrainian line. So when Ukraine has found this location where they are confident that they can uh, attack and find a breach, they send in reinforcements, vehicles and manpower. And unsurprisingly, Russia sees this with, that's my dog in the background, uh, Russia sees this with their drones and Russia realizes that something is up. So. Russia realizes that Ukraine has gathered a lot of troops and that they will more than likely advance down a certain lane. Knowing that uh, where the uh, Ukrainians will more than likely attack, Russia begins to reposition their forces uh, with uh, anti-tank guided missiles, anti-tank uh, weapons and what have you. And uh, RPGs, they move them uh, into position where they believe the Ukrainians will assault. Even moving up tanks and IFEs to help out. And they prepare uh, to defend uh, where Ukraine now has gathered troops. So right now, Russia is ready and the Ukrainians are about to launch their attack. Russia also prepares artillery and uh, informs anti-tank uh, missile teams further back the line and even gunships, helicopters that have anti-tank guided missiles uh, and inform everyone to be ready to attack this specific spot on the front line. So Russia has now set up a kill box. They have missiles and anti-tank guns ready, they have tanks and uh, other vehicles ready, infantry with RPGs, they have mortars, artillery ready. Everyone is now focused on this kill box where Ukraine is more than likely about to attack through. So 
Ukraine begins the attack and they drive down this what they believe to be a safe path trying to reach the Russian uh, end of the field. And when they are in the kill box, that's when the Russians begin to open fire. Usually they start hitting the Ukrainians with artillery and then everyone opens fire with anti-tank guns, with missiles, with RPGs. The tanks open fire, infantry fighting vehicles open fire. Everyone opens fire. There's more artillery being called in, mortars, you name it. Everything is firing at the Ukrainians. One or two vehicles gets hit and the entire column comes to full stop and now everyone is trapped in the kill box and they have no way of escaping. It becomes even more troublesome when Russia begins firing uh, artillery, uh, what do you call it, uh, artillery delivered mines. You have basically cluster munitions that deploys mines so you can they launch in a minefield behind the ukrainians so if the ukrainians try to leave the kill box they will drive into freshly placed mines and it's just a terrible terrible situation for the ukrainians in this situation and this is the kill box that russia so effectively relied upon to halt the Ukrainian advances. The Ukraine could not maneuver freely due to all the minefields and they were funneled into these narrow corridors where Russia could set up devastating kill boxes. And even if Ukraine managed to push through the kill box or take the Russians by surprise and avoided the kill box altogether, this is when Russia surprised everyone. They doubled down to no end and counterattacked. They just sent in more and more troops until uh, they either ran out of forces and Ukraine managed to punch through or they just overwhelmed the Ukrainians uh, in the windbreaks and they just kept piling in troops until the Ukrainians were forced to flee or get captured or get wiped out. So this doubling down is what caught everyone uh, by surprise that Russia was so hell bent on defending every inch of territory that they uh, had gained. And they just sent in troops, vehicles and what have you to uh, defend these, uh, uh, to defend every position that they um, had control over basically. And even if Ukraine managed to successfully defend against these uh, mass assaults, these counterattacks, if they established a foothold on the far end of the field and pushed the Russians back, the Ukrainians found themselves in yet another kill box because now the Russians could call in more artillery, more mortars, more drones, more everything on this small uh, unit of Ukrainians that now were stuck basically in enemy territory. So they had passed through one kill box and if they were lucky enough to establish a foothold uh, in, Ukraine, in, Russian line, in the Russian lines, then they found themselves in yet another kill box. And of course, the devastating reality of the Ukrainian offensive during the summer of 2023 was that if they punched through the Russian lines, found a way forward, established a foothold and pushed the Russians back, the Russians 
fell back to another defensive line and Ukraine had to start all over again because there were simply the minefields. There was no end to the minefields and they would have to try and scout out a new uh, avenue of approach to the Russian defensive line and the Russians would spot the Ukrainians again with the drones. Ukraine would then try and advance and they would find themselves in another kill box and it would just start all over again. And this is basically how the Russians very successfully, although costly, they lost a lot of manpower due to this uh, uh, tactic of constantly doubling down and not giving an inch, holding every position to the last man was very costly for the Russians, but it can't be denied that they successfully broke down the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the counteroffensive failed because of these Russian tactics. And now we will move on and take a look at the Ukrainian defensive tactics during the winter of 2023 and 2024, fighting in no man's land. So now that Russia began another offensive during the winter months, uh, Ukraine found themselves once again on the defensive. And uh, again, Ukrainian drones are hovering all over the Russian line. This is uh, slightly north of Stepove. And with these drones, Ukraine can see that Russian forces have moved in and massed, gathered for an assault. Uh, they've seen these vehicles moving in uh, uh, for an hour or two, perhaps, and then they can call up a Bradley. And we've seen this in multiple videos of late. A Bradley begins firing at distance, uh, sending in a volley of airbursts, basically, at the Russian positions and trying to take out as many Russians before the assault can begin. At times, it will be enough for the, to force the Russians to call off the assault, but not always. There will be times when the Russians take the hits and then they decide to move on anyways. And just like the Russians uh, did during the summer offensive, Ukraine can now take a look at where Russia is gathering its forces. And then they realize, OK, Russia will be attacking across this field. Now Ukraine can set up a kill box by calling in or getting the artillery ready and they can get Bradley's ready. They can get drones ready to defend this kill box out in no man's land. And the Russians advance, maybe they hit a minefield, not always so, but it does happen that they run into a Ukrainian minefield. And when they are out in the middle of the open, not uh, in their own lines, but when they are out in the middle of the farmlands, that's when Ukraine calls in regular artillery and cluster munitions. And we've seen this in multiple videos that the Russians get hit by these artillery rounds in the middle of a field as the, the Russians are trying to snake their way through these devastating minefields that the Ukrainians have placed. And this is the interesting part. Uh, when Russia was defending, they were defending uh, their, uh, uh, their windbreaks from direct assaults by the Ukrainians. The Ukrainians are doing it slightly different. The Ukrainians are not actively defending uh, every inch of territory. They are actually attacking the Russians out in no man's land, far away from their own uh, defenses, uh, their own uh, defensive positions. So the Russians have not even reached Ukrainians when they begin taking fire. And uh, this is very effective. Sometimes they have to call off the assault and turn around. They're gonna be hitting more mines, but on occasion, uh, or on occasion, they do um, uh, push through the barrages. They do push through the minefields and then they reach uh, their objective, a windbreak. And this is when Ukraine 
uh, what, since the Russians are still in the kill box, they call in artillery, cluster munitions, drones, and even more 25 millimeter airbursts on the Russians. Uh, so, as you see, the Russians are under constant fire as soon as they uh, uh, get out into the open and the Ukrainians just have all these drones spying on the Russians. They know exactly what's going on and their artillery is very accurate. At this point, um, the Russians have taken enormous amounts of uh, fire from artillery, from drones and what have you. And 80% uh, of the casualties in this war uh, is from artillery strikes. So the few Russians that are still alive, if anyone's still alive, uh, will now be cut off on their own and be basically decimated. And this is when Ukraine uh, moves on to the next stage of their very successful defensive tactics. And this is when they send in hunter-killer teams. And these teams are usually made up of two or three vehicles, very often two uh, troop transports followed by a tank, or rather the tank takes lead. The tank drives up to uh, where the Russians are more than likely hiding. The tank fires two, three, four rounds point blank at the Russians, then uh, retreats to avoid getting hit by drones and what have you. And the uh, Ukrainian transports drives up, uh, dismounts troops, and the hunter-killer teams then moves in and hunts down any surviving Russians. And this is basically what we often see in the videos where you have one or two transports uh, dismounting troops that rushes into uh, trench lines to hunt down Russians. Uh, that is going after Russians out in the no man's land as the Russians are trying to push their territory forward. And this is a very successful tactic uh, where the so far the Ukrainians have basically almost managed to kill uh, six Russians for every Ukrainian lost uh, in and around Avdivka. And when they are satisfied that there are no more Russians left, the Ukrainians get picked up by their transports again to avoid drones, to avoid enemy artillery, and they return to their own lines. So the Ukrainian strategy is pretty much to maintain no man's land and uh, in order to lure the Russians out of their defensive positions out into the open as they're crossing the open fields so that they can be targeted by artillery and by drones and uh, relying on artillery, Ukraine then destroys 80% of the Russian forces so that they then can send in the hunter killer teams to uh, uh, mop up the rest, basically. So Ukraine wants the uh, to maintain no man's land in order to successfully defend the line, uh, as opposed to Russia, who, while they made use of no man's land, but they were more focused on destroying any Ukrainian uh, when the Ukrainians were almost on the Russian uh, positions, if you catch my drift, get my meaning. And looking at how Russia defended the Robotina and Verbove, and looking at how Ukraine has defended Stepove and other places along the front line, these are very successful tactics. Yes, the Russian version is very costly, demands a lot of manpower. So uh, the Ukrainians may be a bit more resource effective, but we can't deny that neither side has managed any major gains, even though Russia has done uh, managed a couple of few breakthroughs, or maybe not breakthroughs, but they've gained ground at least the last uh, the last week or so. Uh, but up until this point, the Ukrainians have uh, very successfully defended the line, uh, very much so, just like Russia did during the summer. Uh, 
So why is it that Ukraine and Russia both have such difficult time breaking through uh, enemy defenses? Uh, Ukraine has very accurate artillery. Russia has a lot of artillery. They have a lot of aircraft and bombs are being dropped left and right all along the front line. And despite this, no one seems to be able to push through. And uh, we can actually take a look at history to find out why that is. In World War II, when Germany invaded France, they did so by avoiding the very impressive, very capable French defensive line of the Maginot Line. And the Germans did this despite knowing that the Allies, the French and the British, had prepared a trap to destroy the German army in Belgium. And their solution was to outmaneuver the Allied troops in Belgium by sending a massive armored force in behind the British and the French uh, as the uh, Allied armies were moving to engage the main German force. And that is how we ended up with, with Dunkirk and everything. Um, actually, I have a uh, video dealing with that. So take a look uh, down below and I'll see if I remember to provide the link. But as you can see, the Germans did not want to go through prepared defenses. They would rather actually take their chances going up against the French and British army in Belgium, even though they knew that the French and the British were expecting that to happen. Because they, going through the Maginot line was not an option. The Germans had to go through Belgium and they had to take on the French and the British head on. Otherwise they would basically have they would have lost the war. So Germany had two options, go through the defensive lines or take their chances with the French and British army. They completely avoided the defensive line and took their chances fighting in Belgium instead. And during the Gulf War, uh, despite having had air superiority for a month, uh, the main allied assault into Kuwait went around the Iraqi defensive line. And despite this, the US forces still ended up in the now legendary tank battle of 73 Easting with some 600 armored vehicles taking part and around 8,000 soldiers in total fighting in this massive battle. And this was despite the allies having air superiority, and despite the Allies having bombed Iraq and Iraqi forces back to the Stone Age for a month, right? Despite that, the main attack into Kuwait went around the Iraqi defensive line, and despite having massive air superiority, this main assault still ended up in a huge tank battle with Iraqi forces. So this should tell us that air superiority is not enough to overcome defensive lines. It's not enough to defeat uh, an army that is uh, intent on actually fighting. And of course, then we have the Winter War, where the Soviets, despite having air superiority and a massive artillery advantage and outnumbering the Finns with, I mean, both infantry and tanks, the Russians still struggled when they tried to push through the Finnish defenses at the Mannerheim line. Now, the Soviets, they tried to outflank the Finns, but the Finns held. So the Russians, they, they had no choice. They had to try and punch through these impressive defenses that the Finns had set up. And the result is, you know, what we all read in the history, history books now that the, uh, the fields outside of the Finnish border is littered, littered with thousands upon thousands of dead Soviet troops. <laughs> 
but this is what happens when you don't have the ability to move around as you can see on the map here you had the uh, uh, this uh, the sea to the west and the uh, great lake to the east the Russians were jammed in between these two bodies of water they had no choice they their only way forward was through the Finnish defenses and uh, then if you're gonna break through even if you have air superiority even if you have uh, an advantage in artillery you will take massive losses because you only have one option to send in infantry and have horrendous casualties before you can win and of course we cannot forget world war one uh, on the Western Front, Allied and German forces were trapped between the North Sea and neutral Switzerland, with trenches cutting right across the continent, from the uh, ocean all the way to the Alps. There was no chance of moving around enemy positions like in World War II. The only way forward was through the enemy lines. And despite thousands of artillery shells fired at enemy positions, there was no other way than to send infantry across no man's land and try and kill the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat in the trenches in order to punch through the enemy defensive line. It, you, the amount of artillery you fired at the enemy didn't matter. You had to send infantry into the trenches to kill the enemy point-blank range. The reality is that Ukraine has no way to go around the Surovikin line. Maybe if they manage to cross the Dnieper River at Kherson. The only way to win is to go through Russian defenses. And that means facing the same challenges as the Russians did at the Mannerheim line in 1939 and 1940. And like all soldiers did on the Western Front of World War I. It is very difficult to uproot an enemy in a properly prepared defensive line. Artillery and airstrikes is not enough. 100 years of modern warfare has over and over shown us that dropping an explosive from above on a well-prepared defensive line will not be enough. Be it artillery or bombs dropped by aircraft, explosives from above is not enough. Cluster bombs and air power would not have changed the simple fact that Ukraine would have had to sacrifice a lot of men in order to manage a breakthrough. Ukraine's issue is not lack of air power. It is the inability to clear out mines quickly enough to allow forces to advance at speed to exploit the situation and overrun Russian positions before they can respond. And I think Ukraine showed that they understood this during the summer of 2023. When they realized the extent of the minefields, they switched tactics and slowly chipped away at the Russian defenses. They kept doing this to preserve manpower and equipment. But when they thought they had a good chance to achieve a breakthrough, they did commit fully and assaulted with some 80 to 100 armored vehicles and tried to punch through at Verbova. They just had to get close enough to get past all the minefields. And when they did, they sent in a large force that tried to achieve a breakthrough. Unfortunately, it wasn't enough. <laughs> 
It is safe to assume that Russia is now improving all defenses along the southern front. Formidable defenses will now be even more form formidable. Ukraine's only hope of moving around the Russian defensive line is to cross the Dnipro. But by now, Russia has surely prepared for such a move and has more than likely begun establishing vast minefields south of the river as well. No matter what Ukraine does, they have no choice. If they want to win, they have to go straight through. Unfortunately, unlike Ukraine, Russia has options on how to avoid Ukraine's defenses and experienced Ukrainian veterans. Russia can amass troops at Belgorod and Kursk and attack weaker and inexperienced border units, or either send an army into Belarus or have Belarus itself launch an attack from the north of Kiev. With time, Russia will have the troops needed to open a new northern front line. To prevent that from happening, Ukraine needs to manage a breakthrough in the south. And to do that, they have precious few options. None of them are easy, and all of them involve taking horrendous amounts of casualties in order to win. Thank you for watching. I hope I'll see you in the next one. And uh, until that time, go Pomarsh Ukraine, give them hell.